Good afternoon. Welcome to week two of Imagining America's month-long collective creative engagement. My name is Mina Matlin, and I serve as Imagine America's Managing Director and the lead organizer for this virtual series. Together throughout this month, we'll engage in a collective reimagining of the multiple systems, structures, and ways of being that shape our lives. This week, we begin at our roots, focusing on our relationships to food, land, and the environment. Food and Stories from the Land, the first of our Monday Dialogue plenaries, kicks off our imaginings with rememberings. Before introducing our moderator, I have a few logistical items to cover regarding today's session. The session offers both English and Spanish closed captioning. To access the English closed captioning, click on the closed captioning button found at the bottom of your Zoom window. To access Spanish closed captioning, click on the link provided in the chat. Our panelists will be speaking in both English and Spanish during today's session. If needed, you can turn on language interpretation by clicking on the interpretation button found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please select the audio channel to hear the translated audio in the language of your choice. IA staff will be sending periodic reminders on use of the interpretation features through the chat, but should you have any questions, please send us a direct message at IA Tech. We invite you to use the chat to share your reflections throughout this dialogue. We do anticipate having some time to answer a few questions at the end. So should you have questions for our panelists, please place them in the Q&A. Finally, we invite you to engage with us on social media. Our event hashtag is Reimagining America 20. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Carlton Turner. So there is much to say about this incredible individual who has been a longtime personal mentor and friend, but in the spirit of storytelling, Carlton has his own way of telling his story. He also asked me to keep it short so he, Alsi, and Las Nietas could get to the meat. So by way of a brief introduction, Carlton is an artist, agriculturalist, researcher, and founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production, an organization that uses food and story to support rural community, cultural and economic development in Carleton's hometown of Utica, Mississippi. A member of Imagine America's National Advisory Board, Carleton also serves on the boards of First Peoples Fund and Project South, is a member of the We Shall Overcome Fund Advisory Committee at the Highlander Center for Research and Education, a member of the Rural Wealth Lab at the Rural Policy Research Institute, an advisor to the Kresge Foundation's Fresh Low Initiative, and is the former executive director of Alternate Roots. His awards include the M. Edgar Rosenblum Award for Outstanding Contribution to Ensemble Theater, the Otto Rene Castillo Awards for Political Theater, and APAP Sydney Yates Award for Advocacy in the Performing Arts. Carlton is a former Ford Foundation Art of Change Fellow, a Cultural Policy Fellow at the Creative Placemaking Institute at Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, and is currently a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Fellow. I could go on, but I know you're getting antsy. So I turn it over to Carlton and our other outstanding panelists to serve up the meal. Thank you, Mina. I'm calling on my dark knight, Emmett Turner. That brave Harlemite that straight ahead jazz baritone singing soul that dedicated his world to those with the least. Now 27 years in the ancestral realm, he guides me with the parts of his heart he left for me to hold. He makes my path clearer and my movement certain. I'm calling my grandparents, Emmett and Armisa Turner. They left the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina to seek refuge in the core of the Big Apple from the terror of the white America's reconstructed South. They remind me that home is the place that you make whenever and wherever you enter a space. I'm calling Samuel and F.C. Roberts, my foundation, my soul providers, those that stayed in Mississippi because of indigeneity and because the generations of social conditioning of the South endowed them with the hope of a tomorrow yet to come. 
They were country conjurers of life from soil, womb, and faith. Grandma could make magic with flour and lard, each biscuit stamped with her three-finger brand. In her kitchen, she took raw ingredients grown from her own land by her own hands and became the maker of black boy joy. I'm calling my great and great great grands, the ones I knew and the ones I never met, without whom I would not be. My mother's mother's people, Will and Eliza Broadwater, Gus and Sarah Terry, Admin and Alice Kidd Broadwater, my mother's father's people, James and Leonia Roberts, George and Alice Washington, and Bob and Mary Roberts. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I also call on those living and responsible for me being here today. Genevia R. Turner, the personification of strength and love, straight country determination. Her hands were built to cradle, feed, and clothe babies. Her faith is simply put, unshakable. Her generosity unrivaled. She is the matriarch of a Southern family working to root itself deeper in faith and unconditional love. I lean into my family of culture bearers, a term I was given by my friend and Lakota sister, Lori Poirier. She's taught me the meaning of collective spirit. Next slide, please. That energy and intention that grounds all of her work in purpose, honor, and love. She reminds me that this work is about finding and making our kin in this world, wherever we may find ourselves. And it's because of the work of John O'Neill that I am here where I am today. John's work as a founding member of the Free Southern Theater and member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee supported the educational and voting rights of black folks across rural Mississippi before I was born. John, next slide please. John was my mentor and a father figure for me in the work of art, culture, and social justice. My work is also guided by the leadership of Brother Hollis Watkins Muhammad, a fearless freedom fighter from Pike County, Mississippi. Hollis is a living legend a treasure and a gift to continuing legacy of freedom fighters in Mississippi. My work is also shaped by the words of Sister Nayo Barbara Malcolm Watkins, who taught me that I have everything that I needed. It's already in my bones. She taught me the meaning of principle struggle. You may not always agree with everyone in the room, but if your liberation is tied together, then you have to be able to find a common point to strategize together towards liberation. She is the definition of black love. Bob Moses taught me that no one was dispensable. Everyone has purpose and can contribute to our collective freedom. He was taught by Ella Baker. Together, they devised a plan to help challenge power in Mississippi. I am a beneficiary of their strategic thinking and their vision. Alice Lovelace, gave me the opportunity to expand my understanding of my art and creativity as a tool for the advancement of justice and equity. She taught me the fierce power of words and the power of transformation, that things inevitably change and we are able to shape that change with our words, our work, and our art. Last but not least, Fannie Lou Hamer. She knew that the land was the key to survival for rural black folks in Mississippi. And that reality hasn't changed. She was fierce and genius and caring. She loved black folks and she was willing to take the brunt of the world for that love. My work is an amalgamation of all of these influences. Next slide, please. I am an extension of their intentions. These are my people. Thank you so much for the invitation to host this conversation about land and food and liberation. I want to invite a friend, Alcee Parks, to the table. Alcee is an Atlanta native that advocates and activates the use of food as an organizing tool for healing and liberation. As a child of the South, farmer, organizer, and agrarian culture worker, she serves by cultivating intimate and responsive relationships with and for the land and our people that activate remembrance, 
honor, honor sacred traditions and practice radical resistance. She is a founding member of Black Agrarian Cultural Workers of the South Collective and serves as the lead field organizer for the Southeastern African American Farmers Organic Network, also known as SAFON, that has a focus on weaving and pollinating and crafting kinship in Georgia and Mississippi. And ALSI also represents the organization on the leadership team for the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Welcome, ALSI. <laughs> Thank you, Carlton. I'm still wrapped up in your um, presentation, your introduction, and your, your honoring. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you so, so much. So could you share some of your story with us? Yes, I'm honored to and just want to thank you, Carlton, again for inviting me to be here with you um, and the sisters. And um, for everyone in the background, just making this happen, um, very, very grateful. Um, so yeah, I'll start with, so I, after that lovely honoring, I had like arranged some things around my desk. So one of those things that I arranged around my desk is this picture of my mother, uh, whose name is also Elsie, Elsie Dolores, and my grandmother who has transitioned, whose name is also Elsie. Alcy Helen, um, who was named after her grandmother, Alcy. So I come from a long line of Alcy's. Um, like you said, Atlanta native by way of Augusta, Georgia, by way of Lincolnton, Georgia, which is where I consider um, my ancestral land. Um, and yeah, so thank you for inviting us to just um, offer some of the like legacies that we're stewarding, or at least, um, yeah, the legacies that we're stewarding. Um, the legacy that I'm stewarding um, for my grandmothers um, is the legacies of matriarchs, of big mamas, of mother lines, of radical Southern black womanhood, of caregivers, of midwives, herbalists, homemakers, cooks, and culinary artists providing good vibrations and nurturing and nourishment to family and community. Um, and I've been deeply influenced by my grandmother, Alcee Helen Haas Parks, and my biological grandmother, Carrie Kitty Jones. Um, I wanted to invite both of them in the space because they are the makings of me. Um, and they helped me to queer my mother line um, Carrie, at a very young age, birthed my mother, and um, for her to be in a relationship with my grandmother, Alcee, and to trust her as much to offer her her own child um, has a lot of impacts on me, and so their sisterhood um, really provide a foundation for how I approach life, how I approach kinship and relationships, um, and how I approach my role as a conduit to that big mama energy. Um, so that's, yeah. So um, as far as I, I put together some slides, because I love that you use the language cultural bearer, because um, for me, cultural bearer implies a person who has consciously embodied cultural traditions and is in the practice or the process of transmitting that. Um, and so I wanted to honor Ms. Clementine Hunter from Louisiana, folk artist. Um, this is some of her beautiful work. And I thought that this quote was a really beautiful way to just kind of open up more stories. She says, I tell my stories by making pictures, by marking pictures. The people who lived around here and made the history of this land are remembered in my paintings. I like that. I'm glad the young people of today can look at my paintings and see how easy and uncomplicated things were when we lived off the land. I wanted to tell them. I paint the story of my people. The things that happen to me and the ones I know, my paintings tell how we worked, played, and prayed. Um, so I, I thought that was just a really beautiful way to open because I see, um, I believe that art uh, can create 
or can be maps for how we did live and how we can live. Um, and I just think that it's really um, impactful to be able to like see and embody those possibilities. Um, they create a portal that helps us imagine our thriving futures. Um, I can go to the next slide. <laughs> I was gonna do this for the next slide. <laughs> Um, I too have been deeply influenced um, by Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Jo Baker. Um, this is a beautiful um, collage done by Alexis Pauline Gumps. Um, and the legacies um, that I think I'm, 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 I'm working to weave are the, the legacies of these, these big mamas, these matriarchs, but also um, a legacy that I hope to be, well, I am part of the continuum of is a Southern Black farming culture, um, Black agrarianism, land-based lifeways, um, farmer organizing, um, the spirit of rural resistance, self-reliance and mutual aid. And I feel like uh, Fannie Lou and Ella Jo Baker are exemplified um, that love and strategic thought, as Carlton said, um, and have really helped shape the practices um, that I live into and hope to continue and to be able to share with others. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so this is Cynthia Hayes. She didn't like being called Mama Cynthia, so I just call her Ma Cynthia. Uh, she's an ancestor now. Cynthia Hayes uh, founded Safon uh, in 2006 and she said growing farmers is the key. Farmers are the fabric and that's just the way I like, I, I look at it. It's like a quilt. We are just building a quilt of farmers. That is what we are doing. So I've been working for Safon for about four years. I was blessed to be able to meet my Cynthia before she passed. Um, and in a lot of ways that I, I don't want to say idolize, but, you know, want to be a tribute to um, farmer organizers like Fannie Lou Hamer, I would be remiss if I did not uplift um, this beautiful woman who is a farmer organizer and I am part of her legacy. Um, and I want to uplift some of the other farmer organizers who are are continuing this legacy as well, who are still with us, like Ira, Mama Ira Wallace, uh, uh, Mr. Ben Burkett, <laughs> uh, Mama Dorothy Baker, Barker, excuse me, whew, um, and some of my comrades and siblings, Whitney J, uh, Taz Walker, Shakira Tyler, and Blaine Snipstall, and Dara Cooper. And so, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, but a lot of the work that I get to live into with Safon allows me to practice that cap crafting of kinship um, and building uh, collective power with farmers. And so my role is really just to facilitate spaces and to hold space for farmers to be able to exchange their knowledge with one another, um, to commune with one another, to break bread, um, and to be able to tell their stories um, and build connectivity um, in that spirit of collectivism that is something that I believe Black farmers in the South uh, continue to embody. Um, I also, talking about art, <laughs> uh, my sister Jasira created this really beautiful piece of artwork. So I feel like when we are able to see the lushness of food and land that um, it helps us remember. Um, and that a lot of, I think the work that we're up to with uh, food and, and land in this context is a, a remembering and a recovery of those traditions um, so that we can, you know, live into our futures. <laughs> um, some of my sisters, um, Katrina, Dara, Aliyah, and Shakira, describe innate artistry as a womanist practice of deep-rooted knowledge as a creatively healing, ancestrally honoring, and community self-determination act of land-based resistance. 
And how I take that is that as we are in the practice of growing food and growing connections um, and growing community, that um, that's an art form to be able to practice those things. Absolutely. I'm off of me. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was just saying that was some, that, that's heavy. That's some heavy thought right there. That's, you know, that's, that's deep, deep wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, I try. I was like, "Whoa, these are a, these are a lot of words." <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate them articulating it in this way because I I see that that role of being a cultural bearer and carrying these traditions and stewarding the land and cultivating food and cultivating nourishment and and nurturing for our people um, is is beautiful and necessary go to the next slide and Carlton I don't you can just like be like your time is up girl <laughs> Let me know. you got a couple more minutes okay cool um I offer I wanted to offer some of these beautiful images because I'm I feel like I'm also a part of these beautiful uh black institutions who have utilized food um and land stewardship as a tool for liberation um including the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, um, Black Hill Institute, which is in Baltimore. I just love the, the, the way that they utilize art to uh, communicate um, a feeling about uh, what we're up to together. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, so with my work with Safon and, and farmer organizing, um, I've been able to see some really beautiful people and really beautiful places in these like Southern Black geographies. Um, and so I wanted to share some of those images with you um, because I feel like it is a way for not only seeing the images, but like encouraging us to experience um, the way, all of the ways that the, the land can heal us, um, especially when we come together on the land. Um, so this Mama Sarah on the right at Marshview Community Organic Farm on St. Helena Island. She's been stewarding low country, Gullah Geechee culture um, her whole life. And um, I also want to just name Cornelia Walker Bailey, who is a ancestor now, and Edna Lewis and Zora Neale Hurston as Southern Black women who, um, you know, made it their life's purpose to uh, preserve the the cultures of our people. Um, you can go to the next. Oh, that's Operation Spring Plan. I mentioned Mama Dorothy earlier, um, but that is her farm <laughs> and a sweet baby. <laughs> Um, and this slide shows um, a art ex exhibit that my sister Anna Marie and I curated together to um, allow people to immerse themselves in the Southern Black Woman's Kitchen. Um, we were able to shut corn together and just have kitchen table conversations. Um, and I feel like that is a way for us to to also be in the practice of remembrances is being in the practice of those life ways um, that our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors um, all took part in. Um, you can go to the next slide. I want to make sure everyone has plenty of time. Um, I w this is just an example of. Um, I think those land-based experiences and how healing they can be um, when people come together on the land. This is one of one of my one of my uh, spiritual mamas, Miss Ursine Evans of uh, Pickens, Mississippi, um, on her farm, Francis Flowers and Herbs Farm, um, and some of my sisters who are also artists and spiritualists and herbalists who were able to come up from New Orleans. Um, to be able to experience the healing power of her land and um, the ways in which she's cultivated and been a caretaker of the land is something that um, can be transmitted through the soil. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, and this is my Atlanta family. Um, 
Orange Moon Sanctuary is a home, a communal home that I lived in for several years. Um, it's on its fourth generation of wild women. Um, and we cook together. Uh, we raise children together. We make art and community offerings together. And we just hold space um, for our communities. And I wanted to share this image because I think that the the, the worlds that we dream or we're dreaming about are are super possible. Um, and when we live into the practices of being with one another and cultivating community and eating good and finding intimacy with the land and intimacy with food, um, that we can access our futures. Is that good? <laughs> No, no, right on time. Thank you so much. And we'll come back and have some dialogue together. But I, right now, I want to introduce uh, the sisters, Las Nietes de Nono. Uh, the sisters Mulawe, uh, Mulawaye, and Mapenzi are Las Nietes de Nono. They were raised between the Manuel Aprez housing project in Rio Piedras and the San Anton neighborhood in Carolina. Their artistic practices stem from the Afro diasporic experience in the island colony context highlighting circumstances and elements that are present in their neighborhood. The expansion of ancestral knowledge, the exchange of food grown, and the reuse of found materials. In their creative process, they evoke the family memory to expose the systemic oppressions that have lived through, that they have lived through for generations. Um, I met the sisters as part of the Ford Foundation um, Creative Change Fellowship, um, had an opportunity to spend a couple of days with them in New York, and was like, hey, I want to come to Puerto Rico and learn more about what you all are doing. They talked about their grandparents' land uh, and how they were reclaiming the, that space um, and reclaiming the, the, just the way of life that ha has kept their community alive. Uh, and I was pleased to be able to come down and spend some time with the two of them, me and my wife. Uh, and so I want to turn some time over to you all to tell us a little bit about the legacy that you extend from and welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for, um, for the invitation, Carlton. I'll see. Sorry, just one moment. Okay, <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, so glad to be here with you all and sharing um, all this reflection and Mulawai, you, you, you will start. <laughs> sí, gracias. Um, quería compartir este, mi agradecimiento con ustedes, pero también eh, eh, hacer unas preguntas y estimular esta conversación, ¿verdad? A través de una memoria eh, familiar que tengo bien presente. Eh, eh, ¿Cuál ingrediente, alimento, les conecta con las memorias de su infancia? ¿Qué comida has intentado preparar porque extrañas a tu abuela o a tu madre? ¿Qué deseas comer cuando te sientes triste o estás lejos de casa? ¿Qué comida te preparas cuando sientes que vas a enfermar? Tenía 13 años cuando comencé a llorar cada vez que mi mamá estaba preparando la comida. Lloraba porque no estaba lista y me impacientaba. Veía a mi mamá avanzar, cocinar rápido, más rápido. Me decía que lo tomara con calma, que el arroz le faltaba bien poco. Me lo daba a probar para que me diera cuenta que todavía estaba duro. Me decía que ella mismo se ablandaba. Yo le preguntaba a más qué vamos a comer. Ya la comida está... ¿Cuánto falta? Mi madre de adulta me ha contado que estuve llorando desesperada por la comida durante un año, tal vez un poco más. Para esa misma época había muerto por razones eh, que aún bien no conocemos mi padre. No lloré cuando supe de su muerte, pero la noche de su muerte sí recuerdo estar en la cocina abriendo y cerrando la nevera una y otra vez para ver lo que nos quedaba de comida. 
para ese mismo periodo de la muerte de mi padre, el llanto insólito por la comida que no estaba lista. Llevábamos ya algunos tres a cuatro años de habernos mudado para la zona urbana, de la zona urbana a la zona rural. Mi madre aún no se acostumbraba a vivir en la zona rural. En ese momento vivíamos uno de tantos otros periodos de tensión económica y precariedad. Sobrevivir se había vuelto una constante. Buscar soluciones para que hubiese suficiente comida para las nenas. A pesar de que para esa época ya teníamos tierra. Mi madre fue la primera generación que se criaba en, de, en la zona urbana luego de las expropiaciones de tierra que llevaron a miles de personas a vivir en proyectos, en proyectos de vivienda social donde no había tierra para el cultivo. Cuando yo tenía 13 años, ya gracias, a, ya gracias a, a, al, al legado de nuestros abuelos ya teníamos tierra pero teníamos una relación bien difícil porque estábamos entre que lo rural era lo antiguo y lo urbano era lo nuevo y lo moderno. Lo urbano se traducía en conflate, chepoyardí y comida industrializada. Lo rural eran las viandas, las raíces y era la comida que nuestros abuelos paternos nos ofrecían. Así que la expropiación fue un proceso violento eh, para mi madre y para su familia y trajo unos cambios eh, complejos, ¿verdad? En nuestra relación con la comida y en cómo nos íbamos a nutrir eh, y en cómo íbamos a vivir esta vida moderna eh, desconectadas un poco en nuestro proceso con la tierra. Las imágenes que están viendo son imágenes para eh, ¿verdad? tener esa sensación de lo que es el Caribe, del alimento que se recolecta, de los frutos y, y, ¿verdad? y de cómo nosotras integramos a nuestros proyectos artísticos el vínculo con la comida. Porque es bien importante eh, conectarnos con el espectador ¿verdad? a través del ofrecimiento del alimento en abundancia. Uh, eh, I would love to share a process um, by remembering an event that marked my relationship with the environment, food, and the land. September 18, 1989. Huracán Hugo hit Puerto Rico. Hours After the devastation, we went out to see the trees that had fallen. I remember that every tree that had fallen or remained standing was a story of mourning or rejoicing. My grandmother's spiritual house, made of wood, where she practiced espiritismo and cured sick people, was destroyed and never rebuilt it again. It was the moment when I discovered my resiliency in the environment. The physical work of looking for water in the spring and collecting food from what the huracan had knocked down, sharing food, stories, blessing, and healing remedies. For me, it was an initiation to my new neighborhood, recognizing its resiliency and its resources that sustain us despite the disaster. At, this, at that same time, uh, my life was divided into two completely opposite environments. The panorama of the public housing projects, where my maternal family is from, and my grandfather farm in a neighborhood where my paternal family is. I came and went in those environments. At the public housing project, I lived between innocence and fear that the police would take me away because 
of the war on drugs in the 90s. I was fed with, proce with processed food that the Puerto Rican Emergency Relief Administration gave us. Powdered egg, powdered potato, powdered juice. We had no access to land in the public housing project. And in the farm of my paternal grandparents, eggplants too, chicken broth, boiled potatoes, tamarind juice, acerola, guava. What was compatible in both environments, the public housing and the farm, was the way resources are maximized. The houses were shared with the neighbors for collective benefits. Educational purpose, workshop, to eat, to heal and care. Navigating these two family environments, both with their complexities, combine my creativity with resiliency and collective care. It is that essence that I see in my artistic and collective practice. I am the third generation living in the land that my grandparents cultivate and care for. I'm still eating from the trees they planted, enjoying the house they built with their hands. This still blow my mind. And in me is the constant question uh, of how I am going to expand this knowledge, how I am going to share these resources, and how I am going to preserve and increase them for next generation. All those concerns about how find space in my artistic and community practice. The legacy that I understand, I, I understand that I, I am living with my practice is one of accessibility of opportunities, of access to art, from the intersection of social and environmental justice with a Caribbean anti-racist Afrocentric perspective. This is reflected in my art practice where I share the stories that the colony has made the black bodies invisible and is forcing industrialization in our land. This resiliency is reflected by La Conde Project, um, which, which was my school, uh, closed by the Department of Education in 2017, uh, and which we are currently recovering along with a Black woman collective to implement a community hub that ensures the permanence of our community facing the threat, the threat of industrialization and displacement. This project is important because we as black women are making decisions of how we use our lands, how we take care of our bodies, and how we feed each other by reclaiming our ancestral wisdom and knowledge. It is about our self-determination. So powerful, so rich, uh, so much, so much. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, sisters. Thank you, Elsie. This is, this is just a wonderful start to uh, what I think is going to be a great conversation. So I want to thank you for sharing um, your stories, sharing your family histories, your, your legacies, and your connectivity. Um, when I uh, was asked to put this, this panel together, um, you know, this conversation about land and, and food and power and story, um, I was like, well, you know, uh, Mina asked me who, you know, who do you want to be in conversation with? And you all were the first people to come to mind because you're people that inspire me. Um, um, being in conversation with you, getting to know you, I see so much of my story in your story uh, and I'm inspired by the way that you've been able to move through um, and collect, uh, you know, this idea of collecting, um, understanding and, and growing your, your, your work in a way that fosters relationships, you, you know, when you meet your kinfolks. And it was, you know, the moment I met you all, I knew you were my kinfolk. And, and that, that means a lot. And, and I'm only really interested in being in conversation with kinfolk these days because the stakes are so high. Uh, and so I think that this is a really important conversation because of that. So I, I, I jotted down a few notes, um, but, and, I'm, and I'm really just gonna ask questions and listen to you all, because I'm, I'm, I'm done talking, I think, for the most part. Um, so I want to ask a few questions. I, um, 
the first question I want to, to go to is, is to Alcee. Um, you, there's so much power in, in a name and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the work of naming, you know, in the process of naming. And you talked about big mamas, you talked about healers and nourishers and caregivers. Um, and the fact that you come from this line of Alcee's, like there's, there's, there's a, you know, you existed in a time before um, in a different iteration. And what does it mean for you? What does it mean to, um, to come from a line and, and to have, in, in many ways, this destiny and this path laid out for you um, and, and your work is to, to build on it and grow on it and, 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 you know, just deepen it. What does that mean for you? Thank you for, thank you for that question, Carlton. Um, I spent most of my summers with my grandmother, Alcee Al Parks, and I was able to watch her. So her kitchen had her sewing machine, it had her typewriter, it had, you know, like this is her, this is where she orchestrated, you know, community. And so I watched her bake cakes for folks, you know, like she was one of the only people in our family who had gotten a degree. And so she would read people's legal paperwork, write their, you know, write letters for them. Just like she was very, very active in the church. And so she would always just bring me everywhere that she went. <laughs> and so um, watching how deeply she listened, how um, generously that she cared um, and, and receiving all of the love that she poured into me makes me feel responsible for offering that to others and honoring her memory. Um, my mother, Alcee Parks, is also a very, very powerful woman. I call myself a second generation wild woman because my, my, my mother just, you know, made her own path. Uh, yeah, my, my grandma, was, I don't want to call her respectable because, you know, she grew up in a different generation, but um you know for my mother to um be wildly independent to believe in like this like constant like constantly expanding herself like just growing having life experiences and joy and laughter and the ways in which she offered her hospitality and her you know, just like the way that she like set a space, you know, all of that influenced me so deeply that, um, you know, being, being of a line of Alcee Parks is, you know, and, and knowing the people that knew them and, and know them and, and knowing that I, I carry that, that legacy with me is, um, feel it's, it's a big responsibility, but it's also like, they showed me, you know, they, they were able to, um, through their own just embodied practices, you know, teach me the ways, you know, I, I, I loved um, what, what the sister said about like the, what is the food that you cook to remember your grandmother? And I just remember every Sunday, she ain't cooked during the week very much because <laughs> she was always busy with things. But um, every Sunday she would roll her, her biscuits with her Crisco, we make cheese eggs and salmon croquettes. And, um, you know, my, my grandfather and I just, you know, just loved everything about it. But, um, you know, it was just, it was just how she moved through the world is, is, is why I am um, who I am and um, has given me a, like a generous, like pool <laughs> of like, energy and light and love to be able to give to others because I, she modeled um, for me. Yeah, and I think about um, when I return to, to my community where I work now in Utica, Mississippi, uh, my family's been here for eight generations. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember coming back, uh, I had never not been here in terms of living here, but my work was always directed outwards. So I was always working in somebody else's community in somebody else's city, traveling here and there. <laughs> Uh, and, and bringing that work and, and, and bringing my space and my, my time and energy and placing it back in my community. I remember asking my, um, uh, having a meeting with the, the town mayor because uh, I didn't have a relationship with him. And, and I, um, I took him my, my little portfolio of, of like accomplishments because I thought that that actually would mean something to him. Uh, and, and he went through it and I wanted to have a meeting with him. And we was talking and he was looking through it and flipping through it. 
Um, and it really didn't mean anything to him. Yeah. So he said, well, who are your people? Yeah. I said, well, um, my, um, my mom, you know, I'm from here. My mom, is, her name is Geneva Turner, whatever. And he was like, okay, Turner, I don't know that name. I said, well, you might know her maiden name. You know, her name was uh, Genevia Roberts. And he said, Roberts? He said, you Sammy Roberts' grandson? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. And he leaned back in his chair. He said, "Ooh, your grandmama knew she could make some good biscuits. <laughs> and in that moment, everything that I had, everything that I, that he had done before me opened that space yeah. for us to have a very different conversation than the one that I had brought to him, yeah. which was, you know, I want to, you know, I'm trying to interface with you on this um, very corporate, very, you know, level of, of business. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know who I was. And the only way to share who I was, was to, to share my connection to him mm -hmm. to build that and make that memory of, of how he and I were connected. And he began to tell me about how my grandfather got him his first job on the, on the road crew with the county and how my grandmother would pack extra biscuits in my grandfather's lunchbox so that he, he could have some and how she would send ice cream to, to work in, in my, grandmother's, my grandfather's cooler and how they would work all morning. And when they get to that cooler in the afternoon that, that the ice cream would still be, be good, be still be hard. And that's the place that we began making our relationship, the mayor and I. And so I, I, I really appreciate what you had to say. Um, I had, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, one thing, Carlton, because I sure. don't want you to ask more questions, but I, I started to think about um, authenticity being a currency in the South or just around, just like around, I mean, I think that's what you named around, like, I'm just, I kind of can identify my kin folks. It's how people make you feel. You know, it's, it, it doesn't even have to necessarily be sweetness, but it's just like, oh, that just, it felt good. Um, like our, like, we were resonating and vibing with each other. And, you know, that goes a long way in, in, in I think, just being in relationship with folks. Um, the work is secondary to me, yeah. you know, it's like, yes. it's, it's how you make people feel, um, especially feeling seen and cared for. So it leads me to a question. I have, uh, what was that? No, go ahead. Oh, I thought I heard some. Sorry. So, so the next question is, um, sisters, you can take this if you like. So this idea of memory and remembrance, and and those those words sound um, very superficial. They're like, you know, what does that mean? You know, you you remember something in your head. But how does memory and remembrance, how does it play a role in your day-to-day -day work um, in, your, in your community uh, as you're interacting with people, um, trying to um, uplift those practices that were part, once so integral to the community? Um, um. I think I think um, especially in our work, our work is based on memories, uh, especially the memories that has been untold, uh, that do, do, doesn't figure it in 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 the in the history, especially in a colonial context. So uh, for us, it's very important to reconnect with the story, the the micro stories. To, to reconnect and to recognize. Um, for example, I think like for us, what happened when we start doing art and connecting with our community, we were looking for a name for our collective, like, okay, a name for our collective. And then it's like, everybody called us Las Nietas de Nono because that uh, means something uh, for, the, for, for the community. It means the connection, how you say Carton before, you know, that connection of someone that was before you. And, and we start also reconnecting with memories in our community by also door by door, basically, like sharing like, hello, we are here. Uh, um, uh, we also going to do um, an art piece in, in, in La Casa de Nono, which is called Patio Taller right now. Uh, in our grandfather's house, 
Uh, and people were like, oh, wow, yes, your grandfather, and opening the door and serving us food and reconnecting with food and memories. And it's like, oh my God, this is the best promo that I have ever, you know, going door by door and saying like, hey, I have a, 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 an art piece, a theater piece in, in, in the backyard and people you're sharing food and story. And from that moment, I understand the importance of a, the importance the importance of inter the interconnection of memories and our, our work and how we can uh, honor uh, those memories to, um, to make our work, not just the artwork, but also the community organizing to make it tangible, right? Like real, like it's, it's we are not inventing the rule. We are not, you know, like it's, it's something that um, people has been uh, doing generation by generation. Like for example, right now we are um, doing a fruit forest and it's not because, um, a, and, and that, that fruit, fruit, fruit forest is connected to what, how people have been sustaining, sustaining themselves, you know, in every a piece of land, you know, like all people have fruit, uh, fruit trees. And I think like that, uh, it was give us the opportunity to, to connect with memories, just to really do a, a work that is important, a work that change, but, but change from a continuing a path, a not erasing a, the, the contribution that has been making Our, our ancestors. Sí, y la, la, la comida es un elemento bien importante porque a través de la comida, la memoria, el olor, el sabor, tú realmente puedes eh, sanar. Este, eh, yo, ¿verdad? Bien, yendo a la memoria de el llorar con, con, con la preparación de un alimento, ¿sabes? Hay que hacerse consciente de, de cómo esa, esa memoria está en mi cuerpo, de cómo mi cuerpo reacciona y de cómo entonces yo me voy a empoderar de eso para, para eh, sanar a través de, de mis hábitos alimenticios o de cómo yo quiero conectar con la tierra o de cómo voy a conectar con, con, con el alimento para que me sane y me nutra. Este, así que la integración de, de la alimentación, de la memoria y de conectar Dar, es, es, es vital realmente para crecer y, y evolucionar y, y poder superar eh, traumas y poder sanar el cuerpo porque cuando uno ha vivido muchos procesos traumáticos como expropiaciones, violencia del sistema, eh, uno, uno puede desconectarse de, de la tierra porque estás buscando la manera de sobrevivir este, y hay mucha cosa pasándole a una, así que yo creo que eh, para mí, mi mamá, eh, fue muy importante en ese proceso, mi mamá y las mujeres de mi familia, porque eh, sus historias, eh, sus memorias, ese eh, encontrarnos y compartir alimentos, recetas y estar juntas, pero saber que también, pues, eh, una, una comida te puede llevar una memoria triste, pero también cómo te puede llevar una memoria alegre y cómo uno va a... a a entender eso en, en, el, en, en, en el cuerpo de una para una poder seguir, seguir sanando a través de ese reconocimiento que tienen la, las memorias y, y entendiendo que también nuestra mente y nuestro cuerpo es, es complejo eh, y, y ¿verdad? cómo lograr la sanación desde ese reconocimiento de, de cómo las memorias nos pueden también generar este, deseos por comida este, y también reconociendo nuestra historia eh, de, de, de colonización y de esclavitud. It's beautiful. It's just, um, I remember being there with, with the two of you and, um, and you got, it was the breadfruit and, and, and we were only there like a couple of hours, like three hours. And within three hours, you had prepared that breadfruit three different ways and there were three completely different tastes. But the, but, the, but the thing, was, it was so grounded in the place. It was not an experience that you could have any other place than right there. And there's something about uh, that connection between food and place 
uh, something that grows only in a place or you can only find in a place uh, is really important. But I'm gonna move on to the next question. And I want both of you all, both, you know, all three of you all to kind of touch on this question. Because uh, we, everybody, in, I ask everybody to talk about uh, the legacy that they extend from. And I think it's really important um, because our work doesn't pop up out of nowhere. Our, uh, our work is grounded. Uh, when, when I used to think about when I was a child, always hearing people say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I didn't really understand what that meant um, necessarily as a child. But as I got older, um, it began you know, to resonate a, a much clearer with me about what that meant. And so thinking about our role as artists and culture bearers and practitioners of, of, of practices that, that engage us in the land, in the food, in the people, that this uh, idea of, for me, of culture bearer, and, and you talked about it, Alcee, of about this role being about transmission, about tra transmitting something from one time and place to another time and place, and that your body and your practice is a conduit for that transmission. Uh, and, and this idea that the sisters brought up in their talk which was about ensuring permanence, that this transmission is about ensuring permanence, that the bodies, these ideas, these stories don't get erased. So I would love to hear um, all of you all just talk a little bit about what this idea of culture bearer or you know, what your practice holds as a transmitter from one time and space to another time and space. And anybody can take it, whoever wants to jump in first. Sisters. Alison, whoever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, um, oh, okay, oh, so much. Um, when we were going back and forth, your question was um, with that transmission. Um, say your last question again. Yes. So it's about the role, our role as artists and culture bearers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at um, taking on the responsibility of transmitting culture from one time and place to another time and place, ensuring that our communities and our practices are not erased. Yeah, I. I I feel like with that role, one, um, I think in the context of the like U.S. South, that there's a lot of like recovery work that has to happen um, because we've intentionally been separated from a lot of those cultural practices. I think the sisters named that, which is like moving into urbanized areas and moving away from you know rural life where you know, like the, the simplicity of life, but also like the ability to provide for yourself, the ability to um, access the, the resources that the land provides us have been severed intentionally. And so I think with that recovery process, um, you know, for me, being able to um, sit with elders has been um, a really critical, like, I think, piece of being a intergenerational bridge because I think that um, you know I feel very fortunate that we still have um, elders who never left the land or you know grew up on farms that have all of that indigenous like wisdom um, of those uh, land-based agrarian lifeways and it feels like my responsibility to go sit with them and seek out that knowledge first by offering them my my care um but also just like creating spaces where they feel comfortable sharing but i think embedding what they share in not just embodied practices but like you said in art in in words in um for me being able to cultivate these experiences for other people so that they can um, access that memory um, feels um, really important. I think too, 
um, I used to be a preschool teacher. And so it's, you know, like being able to be around little humans and <laughs> being able to, um, you know, be in that practice with them um, is really special because if we don't ensure that our young people and our youth are also accessing these experiences where they can um, be in the be in the process um, of being with the land, um, then we'll lose our way. And so, yeah, I hope I answered your question um, just around like that, that role of ensuring that other people can access the experiences that I'm so grateful to have been able to access and just knowing that, you know, technology or like city culture or just um, being d distracted or being, you know, harmed by these systems um, don't always give us opportunities to sit with each other and commune and eat and um, to, to remember. And so um, I think creating those spaces and curating them so that, you know, inviting our ancestors to be with us and, and inviting folks to tend the soil together and participate in collective work and, um, prepare meals together and, 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 and break bread together, um, I think really not only honors um, our ancestors and our ancestral identity, but also allows it to extend into the future. Thank you, thank you. Sisters? Well, thank you, Asi, for all the sharing. Oh. <laughs> One moment. Okay, no. Um, I'm, um, I'm thinking that I am here just listening, listening, right? Um, listening, um, connecting, and um, watching. I think like this uh, are very powerful tools for me um, to really connect, like listening. I have the ability to also listen in um, like my, the, the, the people that are here, listening, uh, all, all the things like, let me, let me reformulate, but listening is important, it's, the, it's a key process because what is happening is because the colony, people think uh, from where, where, where we are from in black communities, that they don't have the knowledge because the knowledge it is what the university or the, the academy say that is knowledge and when you live in in a position that you think that knowledge is something that you can um, um, that, that you can access so you you feel that you don't have a, a knowledge right so for me it's very important to listen what is knowledge is and to re reconfigurate what is knowledge in terms of the the, the knowledge of the of the land uh, i have been having a lot of conversation with uh, neighbors that they also say i don't have a grade i don't have a grade and it's like okay so what does that mean you don't have a grade you know a lot you don't need that grade and and i think like listening all this uh, knowledge and connecting the knowledge to preserve and to pass for other generations and also to relearn for me, of course. I, I want to, to relearn and, and, and to unlearn, of course. But uh, something like that, I don't know. Yes, I um, think que, que eh, me encantó to, lo que dijo Alci, porque estoy, estoy, me siento alineada con lo que ella está compartiendo. Eh, es bien importante para mí. Eh, y fue algo que aprendí de mi madre eh, viviendo en un espacio ¿verdad? de zona urbana, era la importancia que había en los eh, proyectos sociales comunitarios de crear comunidad. El espacio comunitario era bien importante, o sea, la celebración, el espacio de estar juntos, de cocinar eh, juntas, eh, y eso fue algo que yo absorbí de, de esa experiencia de vivir en, en, en la zona urbana, y es con lo que yo traigo y puedo ofrecer eh, de mi rol como artista de crear las oportunidades para 
crear comunidad, una comunidad que genere vínculos a través de la comida, a través de la sanación, a través de cultivar la tierra, para que realmente podamos, eh, más que nada, eh, ser una red, red y, y pensar en la horizontalidad de poderes y pensar en que todos tenemos conocimientos para compartir, que todos podemos tener esa autonomía y ese eh, poder, ¿verdad?, que que debe ser eh, equitativo y, y eliminar las jerarquías en esos procesos que se dan, eh, ¿verdad? Para que cualquier proyecto que sea comunitario, con velada perspectiva o con ideas a través ¿verdad? de las artes, pues que pueda permanecer porque, eh, porque la gente es la que lo va creando y es para la gente misma. Este, y creado por la misma gente. Yo creo que eso es como, es, es vital, ese proceso de acompañar y de estar y de participar de una manera este, en su justo lugar, pero sin eh, crear una jerarquía, ni crear que sabemos más que los demás, sino compartiendo esos procesos con la gente. Mm -hmm. just, I just want to share, um, to add something about that, and it is the, like, Um, democratization of the process. I think that's very important uh, to hold those spaces. Like what that means when we implementing a, a, a project, what that means and for who it is and who is going to benefit, right? Because the diversity of our communities are so important and so rich that we need to preserve that. And I think that if everyone has a voice, uh, if, if it's If we can hear inter intergenerational voices, we're going to grow more. So we need to hear all the voices. And I think that uh, uh, has been a privilege to hold those spaces. Yeah, I think that's also, um, that's also looking back, this idea of, of, of remembrance of ways in which um, our communities used to hold each other and used to be formulated which was intergenerational. You had big mama living in the same house with your mom and with your children, the grandkids. And so you had multiple generations, in, in some cases, four generations of family living under the same roof. And so you, you had this transmission of, of, of culture, of practice, of foods, of knowledge, of information, of spirituality, of cures, and, and, and just all of those things were accessible because there wasn't these, um, these barriers or, 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 um, or blockages um, in, in, those, in those relationships. Um, so I have one more question, um, and this is about like COVID. So like, um, you know, how has COVID uh, impacted uh, the, the food security of your community? Um, or what challenges have come about regarding food systems and, and the land? Um, as a result of what we're experiencing now with this pandemic that you have seen that may be something uh, new or something that has been uh, an issue that has been deepened or even something that, is, that has surprised you as a, as a good thing. Um, I'll say that for my community, um, last year didn't see a ton of, of, of gardens. Like there's a lot of land I live in rural Mississippi, so you drive by more blank spaces than you do spaces that are inhabited or being used. Uh, and this year, uh, COVID hit in, in, in February and March. Uh, by April, I saw literally dozens of gardens uh, springing up uh, in the community. And that was really encouraging uh, for me. Um, and I felt like it was an opportunity for us to both recognize what we already had access to, but were not necessarily putting into practice. Uh, and that our community already knows kind of like what to do. This idea going back to um, Mama Naya Watkins, uh, who said, you know, it's all in our bones. We already know, we already have it. It's the idea of coming from the long line of Alces, like it's in there. Like all you're doing is activating it and, and really surrendering to Um, the practice that has already been passed down to you. So um, what, what would you all have to share about your communities and what you've witnessed through COVID? Let the sisters go first. Sisters. Yeah, you can go first, sisters. Um, wow, a lot of things has been changing. Wait, yes. Okay, so a lot of things has been changing. Uh, 
Um, and I think also the change uh, in terms of seasons, of fruits and everything has been um, starting from Hurricane Maria also. Uh, so that process, you know, was, uh, what was something. And now with the, with the pandemic, I think reinforce the idea that we need collective spaces. That in order to, 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 um, to, to stay in our community, we need collective spaces. Because what is happening, uh, of course, with, with the government law, uh, and you need to stay in your home, and, and of course, that's part of the collective care. Um, what has been happening is also a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, other health issues, because you can, you can encounter the others, right? So I think um, that has been something important. Sí. Um, otra cosa es que eh, en nuestra comunidad, um, a raíz de la situación del COVID, se vio afectada por eh, tener acceso a, al no tener acceso a la comida. Este, así que tuvimos que hacer unos esfuerzos para eh, proveer ¿verdad? y ayudar y facilitar eh, algunas de esas cosas, este, algunos de los alimentos para nuestra comunidad. Eh, porque es una, mucho de lo que ha pasado en el proceso con el cierre de la escuela es que las familias con, con hijos han tenido que este, irse fuera del barrio, irse a otras zonas donde, para conseguir acceso a la educación. Así que en nuestro barrio, pues ahora es, hay más adultos mayores. So, hay más gente a la, que, a la que hay que cuidar. Así que se, se vuelve un, un tanto complejo ese proceso. Eh, y siempre hay una, una relación un tanto extraña con el acceso a la comida, porque aunque tenemos tierras y hay frutos, pero a veces los frutos no hay quien los recoja, o verdad, y los, los, los frutos se pierden, y entonces pues eso, eso pues crea, verdad, una, algunas complejidades bien, 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 bien relacionadas a, a la vida, verdad, en, en una zona rural. Este, yo creo que ahora con una, una de las cosas que hemos hecho, eh, verdad, como parte de nuestra reflexión, eh, para ver cómo realmente está el acceso a la comida en nuestra comunidad y cuáles son las prácticas que podemos integrar para lograr que ese acceso sea más, más fácil, es que hemos estado buscando alimentos día tras día para nosotras este, poder ¿verdad? nutrirnos únicamente de, del alimento que está en los árboles, que está, que está por cosechar. Y eso nos ha traído una reflexión pues, bien interesante sobre la comida y lo que implica el acceso en una zona rural que está siendo impactada por la industrialización eh, y que está siendo impactada también por, eh, por eh, la desintegración de la comunidad al, con, con el cierre de la escuela, porque los cierres de escuela lo que hacen es que desintegran eh, la comunidad, entonces la gente tiene que irse y entonces eso, eso trae muchos cambios eh, bien complejos. Yo creo que la situación este de el, eh, del COVID sí, sí trae una, trajo una amenaza, ¿verdad? un riesgo sobre si la gente iba a estar pues, bien alimentada y bien sustentada y bien cuidada. Y eso es algo que, ¿verdad? que hemos ido este, en proceso de, de poder crear ¿verdad? espacios para cuidarnos y ayudarnos. Elsie. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I, I, yeah, I think very similarly, I feel like um, COVID and the pandemic exposed a lot of our dependence on structures that can't meet our basic needs. Um, I would say what you named Carlton about like seeing all of these like gardens popping up. It's like, um, I think people really um, in our communities are taking seriously like, you know, we need to eat <laughs> um, and just um, feeling like one grocery stores are not only um, can't be our only access point to food. Uh, because, you know, the shelves became, you know, empty and unreliable um, and that it was, I think, at the kind of nexus of 
COVID was just like not necessarily a safe place to be. And so what I was seeing, what I was observing is particularly in the community of farmers that I work with is an increased demand for their products and for their food. Um, and not only an increased demand, but limitations on the infrastructure that they had to be able to meet those community needs. Um, and so, you know, you know, being able to have some access to rapid response funds for farmers to be able to expand their production, pay some bills, you know, like the, 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 the moving around of resources has been something that's been really interesting to observe in this time, especially kind of in this, um, in the context of um, movement work, social justice work and, um, you know, institutions and nonprofits. But that like, as this demand for food coming from a place where you know your farmer or you know you can trust it was increasing, like it increased the, the I think, the understanding that particularly black farmers in the South um, have always named that like access to capital for infrastructure and labor were, were, were persisting needs. Um, and so being able to, um, you know, kind of put that at the forefront of um, how resources are being allocated and used has been something that is really exciting to me because it's not just being able to have the infrastructure to maintain production and to expand production, but it's also to be able to provide people with access to land uh, for sanctuary. Um, you know, uh, I was I was in Atlanta caring for my nephews um, when things started shutting down. And my first thought was like, we gotta get to the land. I don't know what's gonna be happening in the city, but like, we have to get to the land. I felt very fortunate that I had relationships with farmers all over the South where I could be like, how many beds you got? You know, and being able to like organize my folks to be able to have the option to, to go to the land because you know, being confined to our homes, you know, not all of us are fortunate enough to have yards or garden space or like beautiful lush things to tend to and food to access. So um, those are, I think, one of the ways that I've seen um, the changes in, in, in this time, but also the, just the ability for people to slow down and rest has been, um, I think a uh, unexpected uh, benefit of COVID. And I think it's also given us more time to be with our loved ones. You know, it was an impetus for me to actually, you know, stop kind of uh, putting all of my energy kind of outward <laughs> and be like, um, let me go home and take care, of, you know, like be with my mom <laughs> and like be with my family members and, you know, provide that, that, that care that, um, to my most kind of intimate units of, of community. Um, and just leaning, I think leaning into a mutual aid as well. Like you said, that, that that's something that's always been a part of our traditions. But I think, you know, kind of having this kind of false sense of security <laughs> that uh, capitalism can, you know, generate for us um, was exposed, you know, like our, our need for each other, um, our need to like lean into the relationships and, and, and the care of each other, um, whether it is, um, you know, creating pods for our children to be able to interact with each other because they're not able to go to school or, you know, slide each other, like little cash app, you ain't got it, I got it, like let's, let's, let's figure it out. And so seeing these beautiful kind of like, um, efforts to not even just reimagine mutual aid, but like be actively in the practice practice of, of mutual aid is something that I feel like has been a, a beautiful thing to observe and be a part of. Um, yeah. So it's a couple of questions uh, from, the, from the chat box. So I'm gonna share those. We've got about 10 minutes, so we're gonna keep it brief. Um, the first question is, uh, as you spoke about some of the mutual aid spaces, um, what are some of the new access points that should be in development or the, the things that need to happen uh, to come about to, to improve 
um, situations around food and land. I think you just spoke about some of them, um, but I'm just, you know, offering space to, to offer up more. Oh, I would say, and I'm sure this is a question for all of us, but um, I would say um, part of new access points, I had a friend who named like the, the sign of a good farmer is to a farmer who seeks to reproduce themselves. And so being able to share the gift of like connect, like being able to generate a spiritual connection to land and um, for like young people to be able to, to nurture seeds and be able to grow food for themselves, I think is really important because not only it has that like demand for like wholesome, you know, like food that you can access in your, our communities um, and, and knowing how much that matters, but it also matters that we are offering that gift to um, more young people, um, you know, the age of the farmers are, are, are rising and um, being able to teach and be in that exchange, I think is, is, is a critical access point um is we need more growers we need to be producing more growers um yeah i'll, I'll leave it at that sisters es importante eh, en nuestra situación encontrar es tener mayores espacios para tener tierra y poder seguir cultivando acceso a la tierra porque pues la industrialización en nuestro barrio está ganando espacio mm. entonces la gente se está quedando con menos espacio para cultivar eh, y tal vez hay un hay que hacer como un proceso de cambio de conciencia que tiene que ver con la idea de el cultivo eh, eh, para la familia pero también pensar en cultivar para la comunidad que, haya, que sea cultivo para, para poder compartir y que haya un acceso equitativo. Eh, eso en combinación con hacer esfuerzos para que jóvenes estén interesados también por el cultivo de la tierra, porque se está quedando la sabiduría en las personas mayores eh, y entonces pues necesitamos como comenzar a, a tener espacios para compartir más, más, el, más eh, esos conocimientos y esos saberes. Yes, I'm so glad you said that because I, I, I feel like that those, those spaces for, for skill sharing um, are super important to learn how to can preserve our foods, prepare our foods. Um, but yeah, thank you for naming that specifically is um, creating spaces for, for skills to be shared. So the next question, and which may be our last question, uh, is for folks who, who, who are in urban areas and, and don't or may not have access to land, um, what should they be looking for in terms of, of um, system structure, support, um, items, places, people uh, in, in urban areas that they may want to be looking out for that could help um, address some of these issues. Okay. Yep. Ah, ok. Puede ser importante en las áreas urbanas eh, comenzar a identificar espacios como terrenos baldíos eh, y, y, y ver qué de esos espacios, ¿verdad?, donde hay tierra, espaciones de tierra grande, comenzar a, a, a generar, ¿verdad?, conexiones y, y comunidad para comenzar a cultivar este, alimentos para para, toda la, la, para todas las personas y, y crear sistemas de, de eh, compartir semillas y de cultivar la tierra, pero también pues cosechar alimentos. Eh, yo creo que para las zonas urbanas lo más importante es crear espacios comunitarios eh, para todos. Este, eh, no, no, no estoy más inclinada en eso que en, en, en comenzar en cultivo. Se puede también cultivar vela para una, pero yo creo que es importante comenzar a, a compartir esos espacios porque el, el trabajo de la tierra es un trabajo, este, puede ser un trabajo arduo y con, en combinación con todas las responsabilidades que tenemos ¿verdad? en la vida, 
este, que el sistema capitalista ¿verdad? Pues nos empuja y es así, pues yo creo que es una buena combinación comenzar a, a crear la, eh, pasos comunitarios para el cultivo en, en, en extensiones de tierra que, que se puedan identificar. Yes, and, and I think like, for example, in terms of uh, people living in housing, uh, in public housing project, um, part of, of the law say that you can't, you can't grow food. You can't, even if you are in, in the first floor and you have asset, a little um, piece of land, you can't have your chickens, you can have your uh, tomatoes, So I would love to see a um, Politica Pública, I don't know how, what's, what's the name in English, but um, a, a public law or something like that, that, uh, that ensure and, 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 and also that can uh, leave people that live in housing project that they can grow food. Because a lot of uh, people in the housing project, they wanted also to have access. But the law do, 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 not, do not permit that. And, and I think that um, it's part, of course, of, um, yeah, like, well, that's, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so bad, really, that people that cannot, you know, have access to land. So thank you. And the last question that has come through is, is a huge question. So there's no way for us to answer it, but at least we can at least uh, put the question out there and allow space for discussion. But um, the question is, how do we reconcile the fact that the land uh, that we are farming and stewarding is stolen from indigenous people? And how are we grappling with this history in our efforts? That is a really big question. <laughs> um, I think part of the like grappling um, is seeking out relationships with indigenous land stewards and indigenous communities. Um, I, I think as just a, a, as an access point, because I feel like oftentimes our communities aren't, are not necessarily sharing in community space where we have, you know, like our kind of individual kind of like the community spaces that are relevant to our our own cultures but i think when we begin to be intentional about cultivating those relationships across um cultures um that we can begin to have more of those conversations to 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 reconcile that we are on on, on shared land but you know primarily not primarily but um on indigenous land with folks, particularly Black folks, who's, you know, this, this whole social experiment um, has taken the labor from our ancestors' bodies um, and finding ways to uh, c commune together. Honestly, I think that that communion between Black and Indigenous and Brown communities um, where we're able to identify the parts of our cultures that are the same or that are that that resonate with us and being in those practices together i think gives us a foundation to have some difficult conversations but also like very necessary conversations about how we um build more self-determination and more sovereignty together Yeah, I think sovereignty is for me is where it's at. For me, the, the black liberation, um, it, 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 it depends on the sovereignty of indigenous communities. And, and those things are, are inextricable from each other. They have to, you know, we can't talk about black liberation without talking about indigenous sovereignty um, because an indigenous sovereignty stance um, removes the colonizer from that space. And, and that's, that's about the liberation of us all. Um, would you, do you all want to um, speak to that question just for a second or, or no, we can, we can close out. Didn't know if you had something you wanted to add. I, I think, um, the, oh, okay. Now, 
Um, I think it is important in the, con in the col colonial context that we live, that we recognize, um, of course, uh, how, are, uh, how indigenous people here in Puerto Rico, you know, uh, were um, also to reconfigure the, hist the, the history because here the history in Puerto Rico is like indigenous people uh, were, was exterminated all of them. It was a big extermination and they don't want to recognize that um, it's still indigenous people in this land. And we need also like as a black uh, communities recognize the legacy and also recognize and reconnect. And, and, and I think those, um, those communications are very important because the history in Puerto Rico has been always erasing indigenous people here in, the, in a colonial context. So, so I think it is important to recognize, you know, and to recognize and to honor and to give space uh, for the legacy. Thank you. Thank you, um, all of you. Um, it's just been um, Olawaye, Mapenzi, Alsi, thank you from the bottom of my heart for agreeing to be a part of this conversation, for sharing your, your afternoon, late evening, early evening with me, with this group of people, with um, Imagining America. Um, thank you to the crew at Imagining America for helping to put this together. Um, I know that this is just um, one of many iterations of configurations that we will find ourselves in as we continue to do this work and find our kin. Uh, and I consider you all to be my kin, so thank you all so much. Um, with that, I wanna offer a call to action. Uh, and the call to action as we thought about it and we talked about it a few days ago is about, um, is about really getting outside of your home uh, and, and collecting and gathering. What can you gather in your community, in your space around you um, that can aid you in your survival? Uh, and um, more information will be coming as the call uh, goes out through Imagining America, uh, but we want you to challenge you to call you into action of, of survival and gathering what can you find in your space around you? Not going to the grocery store and, and shopping, but around you uh, in the environment, what can you find to aid in your survival? Is there anything you all want to add to that call? No, we're good? I think so. I think we're good. Yeah, there's, I mean, the, the, the land, nature has all of our medicines um, and getting into a practice of foraging and dis rediscovering or discovering um, a lot of these plant um, allies and aids. Um, I think it's, it's, it's beautiful to just be in the practice. Thank you. All right, I am going, I think it's turn to bring Mina back on. There she is, Mina. This is a safe. Mute. Zoom technology. Um, so I want to say, you know, many thanks um, to you, Carlton, to Alsi, to Mapenze, to Malawi, to our interpreters for providing this opportunity to build community um, and to all of our attendees for joining us for today's conversation. You know, we invite you to share your responses to the call to action on social media using the hashtag reimaginingamerica20. So as Carlton mentioned, we'll have more information about the call to action and hope to capture what you're doing in your community. Um, also for a deeper exploration into the ways we might reimagine and rebuild our relationships to food, land, and the environment, our panelists have provided us with a list of resources that we'll be distributing to all of you. Um, and finally, we invite you to visit iagathering.org for upcoming programming organized by members of the IA Consortium and the 2020 Collective Creative Engagement Planning Team, which includes, um, for the last question, looking at um, this question of remembering and indigenous sovereignty with respect to land um, through the program on remembering that you'll be able to find um, that's also taking place today. So we invite you to um, listen to Monique Verdun um, and, um, and the New Art Museum and that program that dropped today um, exploring that question. So for all of you, thank you for being with us here today. Have a wonderful week and good evening.